Good afternoon, everyone. The purpose of this briefing is twofold. While the launch team was meeting this afternoon to develop a go-forward plan for Space Shuttle Endeavor, President Obama was here, and uh, he has just left, as we've seen. So we will get a status on the uh, visit of President Obama as well as a status on Space Shuttle Endeavor. And here to do that for us is our Kennedy Space Center Director, Bob Cabana. The Chairman of the Mission Management Team and the Manager of Launch Integration at Kennedy Space Center for the Space Shuttle Program, Mike Moses. Good afternoon. And our NASA Space Shuttle Launch Director, Mike Leinbach. Good afternoon. And we'll begin first with our Center Director, Bob Cabana. Bob? Thanks, George. Well, obviously, uh, we would have very much loved to have seen uh, Endeavor lifting off uh, this afternoon, but uh, that wasn't to be the case. And, uh, you know, I'd much rather be on the ground wishing I was flying than in the air wishing I was on the ground. <laughs> and uh, safety always comes first. Uh, these guys will talk about the, the issue that we had in our plan to uh, troubleshoot it. Uh, but in spite of that, uh, even though we scrubbed, the president uh, elected to continue with his visit to the Kennedy Space Center with his family, and uh, I think he really enjoyed it, and I know his family did. Uh, he arrived uh, on time, uh, got a great tour of uh, Atlantis over in the Orbiter Processing Facility with uh, Janet Cavandi. Uh, came over to the LCC and uh, met with uh, the crew. Uh, the crew is in great spirits, uh, had a long conversation with them. And uh, then he met with the, uh, the crew families and uh, talked to some folks <coughs> along the way uh, as he was uh, touring the facility. So uh, it was, uh, he, he was extremely supportive of what we were doing. Uh, he obviously wished he'd have seen a launch too, but uh, he uh, promised his support and uh, told us to look to a, a good future. So, you know, a lot of times we talk about this transition from uh, space shuttle to the future, and I, it's really difficult. And he understands it's hard with folks uh, that are losing their jobs, but um, we're going to focus on doing uh, bigger and better things. And in order to uh, work on a program that's going to take us uh, beyond our home planet again, uh, unfortunately, the shuttle's going to come to an end. I think that. Uh, we are going to have a, a good future as we enable commercial space and we build a, a large vehicle and uh, a rocket that's going to take us beyond our home planet. But, um, you know, we're going to make that happen. It is going to, to work. And the reason it's going to work is because of the tremendously talented workforce that we have here at, uh, at the Kennedy Space Center and within NASA. So uh, I think it was great that he came down today. Uh, I think the family really enjoyed the visit. Hopefully we can lure him back uh, for another launch in the future, at least get the family back here. And uh, when it's right, uh, we'll get Endeavor off, and uh, hopefully uh, that's not in the in the too distant future. In the meantime, the crew is staying in quarantine, and uh, they'll be occupied here for the, uh, <coughs> the weekend, and uh, their families are going to stay with them, and uh, they'll have some time together too. But uh, we'll, we'll fly when the time is right, and I'll let uh, the two mics cover that. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Well, let's see. Uh, let me back up and start with uh, with an amazing job by the team to, f to first even get us to the position to be ready to tank. Uh, last night when we left, uh, the uh, the weather front coming in was supposed to hit around 7 p.m. It didn't hit till much later, which really threw us a loop for retracting the RSS. I'll let Mike go into the details, but uh, but his team did an amazing job of getting that done. We uh, I think we rotated the RSS about five hours late but we had an on-time tanking this morning. So the team did an amazing job of uh, working ahead on what they could and, and having a plan ready to execute as soon as the weather cleared up, and they did just that, a really great example of, of what the, the team here at Kennedy can do. Uh, once we got uh, uh, on console, heard the weather briefing, looked like a really good day to tank, so we, we got started with that. Had a few uh, little things just to keep us talking. There was a, uh, a leaky hydrogen fill line on the MLP uh, in the right ohms. One of the regs was was running a little higher than it should, so we hooked it up to a, a different tank to, to put some ullage in there and, and bleed down that pressure. Uh, and then we had the APU heater problem. <coughs> um, basically, in, in the APU system, APU stands for Auxiliary Power Unit. It's the, uh, it's the system we use to generate hydraulic power. So it burns off hydrazine, uh, spins a turbine, which drives a pump, which pumps hydraulic fluid around the orbiter. We use that hydraulic fluid to uh, throttle and gimbal the main engines, move the aero surfaces, everything you'd, you'd use hydraulic power for in an airplane. 
uh, a large airplane. So we, uh, we had a problem in one of the heaters on the fuel line, and, and the fuel is hydrazine. And when you get in orbit, uh, if you can't keep the heater on, that hydrazine can freeze up. And when it freezes, that line can get compacted and, and loaded up with a lot of hydrazine. And when it thaws, you're worried about a big pressure spike coming into the line as that hydrazine thaws uh, and potentially rupturing the line and causing a leak. Leaking hydrazine is really bad because when you get back in the atmosphere, it immediately catches on fire and would have a big problem. So we don't want a fuel leak in, our, in the aft compartment of the, of the orbiter. Uh, this particular system, there's two heaters on this uh, APU-1. Uh, both of them are required for operations uh, so that we, we do have the redundancy because if you did lose your last heater while you're in orbit, you wouldn't necessarily have time to react. Um, the, uh, the loss of that system on orbit, what we would do is, uh, had this problem occurred once we got on orbit, uh, we would have noticed it, uh, the crew would have evaluated and the, the ground control team would have evaluated the, uh, the thermal response. We might have been able to periodically run the APU to keep it warm. Um, kind of doubtful in the attitude that we get stuck with in station because uh, both of station's restrictions and shuttle's restrictions, we can't really uh, maneuver wherever we want to from an attitude and put the sun uh, on the right spot. So we probably would have burned that system off, basically burned it to depletion, got rid of all the hydrazine. Uh, and therefore not worried about it. Loss of a single APU by itself on orbit is not uh, an early mission termination. That would have been an okay posture to be in for the mission had we lost an APU. So had we not caught this pre-launch, uh, it, uh, it would have been an okay uh, day on orbit. It wouldn't have been a bad day. Um, but it's a really good thing we did catch it because that gives us the opportunity to now fix it and launch with, uh, with full up redundancy. Um, Mike can talk to you about a little more about what signature we actually saw and what we're going to now, now have to do to troubleshoot. But it was a pretty pretty straightforward uh, uh, scrub today. The team uh, made a very good call. Uh, we talked about it for about the right amount of time, and then we talked a little bit more just to make sure we really did have all the, uh, all the right uh, understanding of the system, and more importantly, to make sure while we were sitting there, you almost get a kind of a free orbit checkout because you have that really cold hydrogen and oxygen in the aft compartment chilling everything down. So we really got to see how this heater performed and all its associated heaters. Uh, we wanted to make sure before we started the drain that there weren't any other troubleshooting steps to take. Uh, and we did that, uh, didn't have anything to do. And so uh, Mike uh, made that scrub call and it was, a, it was a really good one at the right time. Um, so now we're in a recovery plan. I'll let Mike talk to you about that plan. Um, and what that means to us in terms of the range and the schedules, um, we, we look like we got a good shot to keep trying here. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's an atlas that's uh, scheduled for launch right now on the 6th. Uh, so our last possible launch attempt would be on Wednesday the 4th in front of that atlas launch. Uh, they look like they're still in good shape. We'll obviously keep tabs on them as we go forward. But uh, if we had to go on the other side of them, we'd come back probably around the 8th or 9th. Uh, those aren't really good launch days from the station's perspective. Uh, that would couple the shuttles undocking with the 25 Soyuz undocking, and we don't want those two events on top of each other. Uh, this is a case where we can actually uh, allow the 25 Soyuz to undock while a shuttle's present. We just can't do that on the same day. So we'd have to wait a couple extra days. We'd probably move to the 9th, maybe even the 10th, as our first launch attempt on the other side of Atlas. We're going to have to go do some homework there and, and talk to the Russians about exactly the right way to deconflict that. But we're not going to do too much on that just yet because we think we still got a shot in front of Atlas. And uh, with that, I'll stop talking so Mike can give you more of the details. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Well, let's see. The, uh, Mike mentioned how well we did overnight. The launch team did overnight getting recovered from the, the rotating service structure delay, and that was an outstanding effort. To say it was four or five hours late probably doesn't sound like much to, to the folks in the room, but I can tell you uh, that it was an outstanding effort. Uh, probably the latest we've ever rotated the RSS and still got to tanking on time. So tanking was going perfectly fine, and we started talking about the APU issue at about 9 o'clock this morning, give or take a few minutes. And what we saw was that when the fuel line chilled down because of the environment in the after the orbiter, the thermostat that controls <coughs> the heater didn't come on, um, didn't command the heater to come on. It's much like a thermostat in your home. When it gets cold and you want the heat, the thermostat kicks on the heater. That didn't happen. And, um, there was, wasn't much troubleshooting we'd, we could do while we were still in, in uh, ET load. We had to get back into the crew module and, uh, and command some, some, uh, the heater on from the, crew from the crew module itself. So we had to wait until we were done with ET load to get the, the ground crews into the, into the ship and do that next part of the troubleshooting, which was to command the heater on from the crew module. And that didn't work. And so w at that point, we knew we had a, a problem with that heater. We weren't sure if it was a thermostat or the heater. And, uh, but we knew we only had one of those two, and we did some talking. As Mike said, we talked for a couple of hours about could we get comfortable launching in a configuration like this, 
And frankly, this was a, this was a pretty straightforward scrub uh, declaration today. You don't like lifting off without redundancy, especially in a critical, sy in a critical system like that. So we declared the scrub at 1216 today. Uh, the team immediately got into the drain operation of the external tank. Both commodities are off the tank now. It takes us 24 hours to fully drain the tank. There's a, there's a little bit of hydrogen left in the bottom of the tank that has to boil off, and then we inert the tank with, with helium. That operation takes a full 24 hours from the scrub declaration. And so tomorrow afternoon uh, will be the first time we can start going into the after the orbiter, which is where this fuel line is for the auxiliary power unit. We have to go into the after the orbiter. We have to get our hands on the fuel line. We have to get our hands on the, on the thermostat and the heater to really see what the problem is. So aft access is absolutely required. That will happen tomorrow afternoon, and uh, maybe about dinner time tomorrow we'll start our troubleshooting. The troubleshooting involves uh, taking in a can of mist and spraying it on the, on the thermostat to see if we can force a lower temperature on the thermostat and have it kick on, lower than the temperatures we could have gotten in the ship today by ambient. And if that works, then we might have just a thermostat that's, that's, that's out of kilter, and we could replace that thermostat and, and be in good shape. If it's more than that, then, then it could be in, a, in a, a box called the LCA, the Load Control Assembly, which is essentially a box full of switches, basically. And uh, if, there's, if there's something wrong in that box and we have to change out that box, that's a, that's a much, more extensive, much more extensive job. It would take us quite some time to do that. But we're not there yet. Right now, we think we can, we can get in. We'll, we will get in and, and do the check on the heater itself, on the thermostat and the heater. And if we can go down the easy path, we're still on a, on a track for Monday morning. Uh, this uh, initial round of troubleshooting still supports a launch attempt Monday morning. So that's the path we're on now. Um, we have a, uh, I have a launch team meeting tomorrow evening to see how the troubleshooting is going, and then another meeting Sunday morning to see uh, what, what happened, what transpired overnight <coughs> sat Saturday night with further troubleshooting. So that's where we are today. Um, unfortunate for Team Endeavor and Mark Kelly and his crew. Um, I talked to Mark when he was in the Astro van. It was kind of funny the way the way the timing worked out today. The crew was ready to go out to the pad, and, and we weren't ready yet to, to scrub. And so we, we let them proceed to the pad, and, and, but then we held them at the, at the launch control centers. There was no reason to uh, commit them inside the launch danger area. And so I talked to them in the, in the Astro van and told them what was going on, and, and they understood. And, and, uh, and then shortly after that, we scrubbed, and they turned around and came back to, to their crew quarters in the operations, control, uh, operations and checkout building. So a disappointing day for Team Endeavor and, and the astronauts, but uh, as we always say in this business, we will not fly this machine until it's ready, and today it was not ready to go. We hope we can get there by Monday, and we'll have more status for you as the weekend goes on. That's it. All right. Thank you, Mike. And we'll take questions now. Please be sure to give your name and affiliation when we call on you and the mic comes to you. We'll start here in the front with Marcia. Um, two quick questions. Um, first, for Mike Leinbach, if it becomes more invasive, are you even going to be able to make the first try out of the other side of the uh, Atlas cutout? And for Mr. Cabana, just wondering if you had a chance to meet with Congresswoman Giffords and any interactions you may have had with her? Yeah, so the first part, you know, we're, we're, we're set up to try for Monday. We can try all the way through Wednesday, and then we have to stand down for the Atlas. So we have a couple of days extra in there to, to play with to, to do a little bit more troubleshooting. Um, so we haven't given up on launching before the Atlas, certainly. That's still a very viable option. If, if, the, uh, if we have to change out that box, the load control assembly, then that's a, that's a significant deal. Um, and the retest on that box is, is quite extensive, a full two days retest on that, on that box. And so that would probably drive us to after, after the Atlas, but we'll just have to see how that plays out. And I did not get a chance to meet with Gabby, but I understand she's enjoying her time in Florida and uh, her time with Mark, and she's doing well. Okay, right here. John Bisney, Sirius XM Satellite Radio. Just for Mike, uh, how quickly did you know this was going to be a showstopper, given your knowledge of uh, orbiter systems when you heard it was a heater problem on an APU? Did you know there's only a limited number of roads you could go down? Did you know pretty well right away you're going to have to call it a day? Uh, I'd say within the first, I don't know, maybe hour, hour and a half or something like that. You, you, you never like to give up too early. But also, as you say, you know, we, we get to know these orbiters pretty well. We get to know the systems. We, we know what our launch commit criteria are. We were in violation of a launch commit criteria. And, and uh, while we were talking of, of, of a potential way out of the violation, we just weren't going to get there after an hour and a half or two hours or so. <coughs> um, but we wanted to be fully convinced, Mike wanted to be fully convinced from the program perspective that uh, we, we exhausted all possible options. 
And uh, so that's why it took us a little time to get to the scrub declaration. Yeah, one of the things, you know, the initial signature looked like just one element of a heater on a line that was failed. And if that's the case, um, the rest of that line can keep thermal mass. We can actually use the attitude of the orbiter to keep the rest of that line warm. So if that was the actual failure case, we could probably work our way through that problem. Uh, once we let it sit chilled down for a longer period of time, we saw that it was actually, in fact, the entire string of heaters along that line that were gone, and there, there wasn't much to do at that point. Okay, right here in front. Randy Siegel, WSTU Radio. Mike, the APUs on the other two were working properly. There was no glitches, nothing that showed anything. So in any of the testing that's done, you're basically just going to work on that one APU only. That's the bad one, making the assumption that the others are fine as they stand. Uh, that's exactly right. Every other, uh, the other two APUs and all their heaters were working perfectly fine, so it's just that one. Okay, let's come over here and pick up some right here. Hi, Mark Kirkman, Interspace News. A uh, couple quick questions, actually. Um, first off, are you tied uh, to Atlantis? Are we in that day-for-day -day trade off in terms of uh, hitting Atlantis' schedule? And also, I'm maybe confusing myself on uh, systems knowledge here. I th thought your earlier discussions were saying that you had problems with both strings of heaters. Wouldn't that lead to uh, not a single point failure, or am I, am I confused in what I heard earlier? Let's see, on the, um, on the Atlantis launch date, uh, they're not yet directly tied one-to-one. -one. Um, I forget how much longer we go, but we knew we could go to the other side of Atlas uh, and probably a week or two before we start running into problems. Um, the longer pull there was, was MLP and SRB stacking, and, and that's all behind us. Uh, but at some point, we do start to bump, and, and I, uh, I don't have the final answer there, but I know it's not imminent uh, to have problems with, uh, with the next one. In fact, we've... We intentionally decoupled the rollout of Atlantis over to the VAB uh, to decouple around uh, Endeavor uh, so that we could get that done regardless of any potential little slips here. We were mostly looking at landing and staying in orbit a couple extra days, but a, a launch slip would have done the same thing to us. So, so I think those two were decoupled. Um, on the heater question, um, it was multiple heaters on string B uh, that, that, that were gone. So right, string A was fine. Right. And w what you probably saw us do was there was both the ground power that we can feed to that heater string and onboard ship power. Uh, it's it's uh, a switch in the cockpit that would send power through an alternate route source. So we were switching between the, the it's what Mike was talking about, having to wait to get in the cockpit to try the alternate power feed to see if, if the problem maybe was on the ground side uh, on the B heaters, and it, it turned out to not be. It was in the on the ship side. And, and the thing that was a, a little bit uh, maybe confusing if you were listening to it, those four heaters, one of them comes on at, at, at a higher temperature than the others, and they kind of come on sequentially is, is the way you can think of it. And so, and so the one that didn't come on, we know there's something <coughs> wrong with that string, either that heater or that thermostat. Um, and then the second one comes on at a slightly lower temperature. That was a little flaky. We're not quite sure about that one yet. We think it's failed as well. And the other two, the other two don't come on in the launch pad because it never gets that cold. And so it... it uh, it's probably a case where, where the feed to that whole string is, is, is off, but I'm, we're just not sure yet. Todd? Um, Todd Halverson, uh, Florida Today, I think for Mike uh, Leinbach. Um, if you had to remove and replace the LCA, how many days or shifts would that take? And um, uh, I was also wondering if you might clarify um, on the unusual turn of the Astro van into the parking lot at the LCC. <laughs> It sounds as if uh, that was done so the crew could caucus with you. Is, is that the way that went, or why exactly did they pull into the LCC parking lot? No, the, uh, the, LT, uh, <laughs> the Astrovan issue, I, I can talk to the Astrovan at, at any point in their travel. And, and so we just let them start coming out to the pad because we needed just a few more minutes to wrap up our discussions. And, uh, uh, you know, knowing the way this was going to go by that time, we weren't going to let them inside the blast danger area, probably not the launch danger area. And it just got to the point where we said, you know, we, we're done with our discussion. It just happened. It was just happenstance that they were at the LCC, and, and uh, that's just the way it turned out. And the LCA? The LCA uh, box change out, the guys were working on that, on that detailed plan. Uh, that's that's, that's going to be a, a, a difficult box to change out. And, and in particular, the retest. There's a good 48 hours or so of retest because there are multiple systems that go through that guy. And so we, we have to lay out that detailed plan um, 
that that would be that would that would take us a couple extra days for sure at least yeah, right Randy Avera Interspace News uh, for both Linebach and Moses uh, anytime you go into the aft compartment it's a hazard uh, to make sure you get in and get out not damage anything how much access are you going to require and also do you have spares for these parts that are in question yeah right now um, access to this this LCA and the heater uh, is, uh, is on the left side of the ship we only have to go in the left door of the of the aft we'll put in the entry level platform and one platform level before that below that excuse me and we'll be able to do all troubleshooting from that from that uh, entry location we don't have to go in the right side of the ship at all and spares, spares no, not an issue we asked that we're, we're in good shape Clara Moskowitz with Space.com, and I was just, just hoping you could clarify the history of this kind of issue. Uh, has it happened in the past? When was the last time, and how often has this come up? Yeah, let's see. The schedule I saw, the, the, re the recovery schedule, it, it did fail. We had a similar failure to this maybe, oh gosh, I don't remember the STS number. <coughs> but that's where we dug out our history. Whenever we have a failure on, on, the, on the ship, we keep good detailed records of how we've recovered from that failure to give us a starting point for the recovery of, of the current failure. And so, yeah, we've had this failure before, but I don't remember which ship it was. Let's see, on, just on the history of this particular one, um, we tend to lump heater performance into a, a category we call it the file nine checkout. Um, if we were gonna ground check out every single heater system, we'd have to do kind of what we're about to go do now, which is go in and actually chill down each individual thermostat to get it to kick on by itself. Uh, and that's a very invasive, intensive thing to do every single flow. So what we do is we check their performance on orbit, um, and if the performance of the heaters, we switch between the A strings and the B strings on orbit, so we give a full ship set a checkout. Um, and as long as there's nothing anomalous in any of the orbit performance, uh, then we consider that checked and ready to go for the next flight. So um, the last time this string was checked on the ground, I think they tell me was, oh, and I just lost the date from my head. It was uh, it was at least two years ago, I believe. But its last performance in orbit was was perfect. So. Uh, something obviously opened up between uh, then and now, and that's what we're going to go try to find. Uh, Greg Dobbs with HDNet Television. Uh, first for Mike Moses, if you end up having had multiple heater failures, you suggested maybe there was a second one, does that point toward or away a thermostat problem or something more important? And Mike Leinbach, two things. Number one, what's the Fisher cut bait time to decide whether you're going to proceed toward a Monday launch? I assume it's sometime Sunday. And you mentioned shortly after the scrub a short circuit. So uh, let's see on the on the multiple failure thing. Um, it kind of depends. A thermostat that's running a little low and just didn't trip, uh, and and when we chill it down, we see that it actually does function. That would be a pretty quick change out. Um, but the rest of that circuit, if there's a thermostat that's failed such that it might have an open circuit in it not necessarily a short circuit, but just an open, that would open up the ground. These things are wired together such that they sh all, the s all the heaters on the, at least the front half of that string share a common ground. And so that opening up would then pull down the, in the LCA box that Mike was talking about, would pull open that circuit, which would then give us the signature where we see the whole string failed. So, so a single failure on one heater thermostat could still cause this problem. That's what we need to go find out. Was it a, a single thermostat by itself, or was it one a failure in there that pulled down the rest of the system. And as far as the Fisher cut bait time for Monday's launch attempt, uh, recall we're going to have to rotate the, the RSS to the park position. That would that would occur Sunday afternoon, uh, probably on the order of three o'clock or so. Uh, and here again, we could be a little bit late as we've just proven on that. But uh, but uh, you know, Sunday afternoon we have to get into launch preparations because we would be obviously fueling the ship Monday morning. So sometime noonish Sunday probably. Bill? Uh, Bill Hartwood, uh, CBS, I guess uh, for Bob Cabana, if I could. Um, what did the president say about, uh, I don't know, you know, I guess giving you some sympathy for having to scrub the launch? I know that that was a disappointment to you guys, but can you tell us anything about that conversation? And, uh, and did he uh, meet with Ms. Giffords, and, and where did that take place, I assume, in the LCC? Uh, as far as the scrub, uh, you know, I didn't talk to him in detail. It was uh, only a greeting and in passing between uh, his stops as we uh, escorted him around, but uh, he was very supportive of, uh, you know, he understands and uh, he, we're going to do the right thing. He had a great talk with the crew. He really enjoyed talking with them, and uh, it went on for some time. And, uh, yeah, he met with uh, Gabby over in the LCC. Just come back over here. Any questions uh, on this side? Okay, right here. 
J.D. Wallace with KOLD uh, TV out of Tucson. I'm just curious, would the wind, now looking in hindsight, would the wind have maybe delayed this anyway since it got pretty gusty right around when it would have launched? See, they gave me the, uh, the actual ob observations. So uh, here at Kennedy, the winds were within limits. It shifted around. It wasn't a crosswind concern as much as it was a, a tailwind. So we were go for a, a landing on the 3-3 runway. So that would have been a go RTLS forecast. Uh, over on the Tau sites, we had thought heading into this that we were going to have a good solid Tau site at Istris and there weren't be any problems. Turns out it rained all day long at Istris and so Istris was actually down. Zaragoza was raining as well, but uh, just outside the circle, so Zaragoza would have been a go Tau site. So we actually had observed go weather both RTLS and Tau, which is a little salt in the wound. <laughs> <laughs> all right, any more questions over here? All right, let's come back uh, over here on the front. Yes, uh, Chair. Oh, can you wait for the mic, please? <coughs> Champ Clark, People Magazine. Is there any knowledge um, whether the Congresswoman will now stay for the launch or will she be returning to Houston? Does anybody have any information I don't on know. that? No, uh, they haven't told us what her plans are. Okay, let's uh, go right here in the back of Ken. Hi, Ken Kramer, Space Flight Magazine. Uh, for Bob Cabana, uh, do you know if uh, President Obama would come back? And um, um, for uh, either of the mics, um, uh, the Atlas, is there any chance the Air Force might, might make room for, for the shuttle if you have to have a few days in the middle of the week? Well, he did say that if it was Monday, he wouldn't be able to make it back for it on Monday. But uh, as far as a future launch, we'll have to see. No, uh, no firm commitment there. And with the, uh, with the Atlas, as always, we'll, we'll talk to them and see how they're doing on their processing and how we're doing on ours. And when we get closer to Monday, Tuesday time frame, if we, if we look like we're go and we need a couple extra days, we can talk to them about that. Uh, if it looks like uh, that they're having problems, that might give us a little of room. It might be better to let them go because we need a little extra time to go troubleshoot too. So that's a dynamic discussion, and, yeah, we'll certainly be having those conversations. Okay. Alan Boyle with MSNBC. For Bob Cabana, I wonder if you had any more anecdotes about either the meeting with uh, Congresswoman Giffords or any of the other interactions. For example, you hear some of the statements that Obama may have made, like "Where's the duct tape?" or uh, uh, other uh, bon mots that uh, you might be able to pass along. Sure, his his meeting with pri was private with uh, with Gabby, and uh, as far as uh, when he was talking with the crew, I really wasn't listening to everything that they had to say, but they were. Uh, they were just talking about, uh, you know, the mission and what they were going to do and on it, and uh, he was extremely interested. Uh, I understand the girls asked some great questions when they were touring uh, Atlantis of uh, Janet Cavandi, and they were uh, really enthused, and as well as the president and first lady uh, uh, talking about seeing Atlantis up close, and I know he enjoyed his time with the crew. You had a question all the way in the back? No, let's not do that because people on NASA TV can't hear you. Donna Leinwand with USA Today. Can you tell me how the astronauts will be spending the next couple of days and how much access they'll have to their families and what you'll be doing, them, doing with them to uh, keep them up to speed? Well. I guess uh, I haven't been there before. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they're, uh, they will have time with their, uh, with their families, obviously not their uh, children, but uh, those that are old enough to have, uh, you know, allow them to be in quarantine and visit them. Uh, there will be time out at the beach house to uh, relax and get together with their families again. Um, they'll obviously be uh, going over their procedures on a, on a regular basis, basis, making sure they're ready, and uh, they'll be listening in to hear, you know, how we're doing uh, on the uh, troubleshooting and uh, looking forward to what the weather is going to be and uh, what the plan is for going to fly. But mainly they're just going to be relaxing in crew quarters. Uh, they're well prepared. Uh, they've worked uh, long and hard for this, and they're ready to go. So this is an opportunity to just uh, kick back a little bit and relax. James? Uh, thanks. James Dean with Florida today. Uh, first for uh, Mike Leinbach. Just to further clarify, it sounds like the crew knew as they were even suiting up or you know, before they even walked out that uh, a scrub was or this issue was in work and a scrub was either possible or, or probable. 
Uh, <clears throat> well, like us, they know the ship very well, if not better. Uh, I assume Colonel Cabana knows it extremely well. Um, so yeah, they probably understood that this was a, a, a significant problem that we might not make our way out of. But in order to stay on the timeline, had we gotten lucky, uh, we, had to, we had to keep them headed towards the pad and, and the ingress. And, and indeed, if, if we needed another hour or two to talk to the problem, we would have done that and they would have strapped in. And, and had we scrubbed after they strapped in, then they would have understood that too. So it, it was just a very coincidental thing with the timing of the crew. Okay, right here. Smith, KGUN TV in, in Tucson. Does meeting with the president effectively stretch the crew quarantine rules? No, actually, the president uh, was uh, had a, a physical by the uh, flight crew's uh, crew surgeon and uh, was cleared to meet with the crew. And the crew is in a big room. You know, I mean, nobody was up close to him other than the president and first lady, and they were both cleared by the uh, doctor. To make sure family members are okay to be in close quarters. Absolutely. All the whenever we have a crew in quarantine, anybody that is with the crew in quarantine uh, has to uh, have been cleared by a, a flight doc, and uh, it, you know it was nothing unusual or out of the ordinary. Thank you. Scott Powers, from Orlando Sentinel, for Mike Leinbach. A couple of questions. First, could the, the two lines that were involved here, do they each have four heaters on them, is my understanding? Or, and the, the second yeah. question is, uh, the, L, the, the, um, the uh, switch box, when you get that off, is the problem uh, that takes a couple of extra days mainly because of so much testing that needs to be done, or is it actually being able to get to it and get it out of that, that spot? Yeah, I'm not... 100% certain of the configuration of, of the heaters and, and the different strings. Maybe Bob or Mike has that. I'm counting them right now. Okay. <laughs> and the other one, <laughs> the other one, we have to get into the avionics bay and, and change out that, that box. And, and uh, so a lot of work to, to open that box, the, the avionics bay up and change it out, close it back out, and then the retest. So it, it's, it's a significant deal. And there's, um, there's, looks like there's 12 different heaters on that line, but not all of them will cycle at the temperatures we see at the pad. So uh, the four we were talking about we knew weren't responding. Uh, there's f uh, the rest of them are in the category of they may or may not be responding at the pad. So we're going to have to do, the teams are doing that exactly right now, pulling all that detailed data, comparing it to the history to say should that heater have been cycling to know exactly which pieces are failed. That helps us with kind of trying to find our common root cause. What are the two lines are identical? Uh, the two heater strings are identical. So yeah, if you think about it, there's a basically a pipe that carries the hydrogen, a, a, a fluid line, and it has a wrapped line around it. Uh, that wrap is a, is a resistance heater. So you run electricity through the wire, it heats up, and it provides heat. And so there's, there's the A string is wrapped along the pipe, and then right beside it, the B string is wrapped along. So, so there's basically two separate heaters that run along the same, same piece of fluid line. And, and so the, the one string was working, the other one was not. Okay, we'll take one or two more, and then we'll wrap up right here. Interspace News for Bob Cabana. In your opening statement, you said that the President Obama said that he would promise you his support. It, could you give us more about the context of that statement, and is this something new from what you've heard in the past from the President? No, I, th I think the President supports our uh, spaceflight program, and uh, he's very supportive of what we're doing. Uh, the commercial space, uh, we've got uh, here at Kennedy Space Center, we've got the uh, commercial crew. Uh, program here at KSC uh, supporting that. Um, he is supportive of us uh, building a, uh, a large rocket and crew vehicle to go beyond uh, our home planet. So he, he just uh, emphasized uh, that he supports what we're doing and uh, he's proud of what we're doing. Grant Miller, the Odessan. I guess this is for one of the mics. Uh, can you tell us how the weather looks for Monday through Wednesday launch next week? I know that's a ways off, but uh, and for here or the abort sites. Um, so I'm, I'm not trying to be flippant, but I don't I don't know, and I'm not sure it matters much, right? Because the the forecasts are what they are. The long range forecast when we talked this morning, we talked at a 48 hour scrub, so that would have been a Sunday uh, attempt, and we kind of looked at the same weather pattern we're facing right now. Um, decent, uh, really decent chance here at, at Kennedy for good launch weather. Uh, winds were dropping off, basically low clouds. Uh, the Tau weather was about the same, which was iffy, but I know that's going to improve because the, the high pressure will be settling in finally over Spain and France. Uh, and, uh, and so we should have decent Tau weather at the beginning of next week, but we haven't even started to look at the long-range forecast yet. 
I tend to delete all the email with a forecast greater than 48 hours in it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll take uh, one more back here, and that'll be it. Uh, James Spahn with uh, Nico Nico. A question for uh, Bob Cabana. Um, did the president have any words of encouragement uh, to you, to the uh, staff uh, here at KSC, uh, with the shuttle uh, program winding down? What, w what were his uh, uh, comments to you? No specific comments. He was just, uh, you know, everybody that he ran into, he, th he thanked them for, uh, you know, what we were doing. And that I wasn't privy to all the con president's conversations, uh, a, a few short greetings. And uh, he was just, uh, you know, it was very positive. He was really, uh, he enjoyed his tour. He enjoyed seeing all the, that he saw and, uh, you know, wants us to keep, keep doing good things. And George, before you wrap up, let me just, I forgot to mention, uh, uh, we had talked a lot about ET-122, our external tank. Uh, and all the modifications it went through. And I, f I failed to, in my opening remarks, tell you that uh, we went ahead, the ICE team went out, looked at that tank uh, because we had it fully loaded. Uh, the inspection teams are out there now, or will be going out there uh, now that it's drained. But uh, the reports from that team were perfect. The, the tank looked beautiful. Uh, their words were that it uh, looked like every other tank uh, performance was flawless from that external tank. So I did want to make sure we mentioned that uh, uh, we ended up getting a good tanking test, uh, so we know this tank is in really great shape. <laughs> <laughs> And I'd also like to just add uh, my thanks to, to both ma Mike's. Uh, I think uh, the team just did an outstanding job getting us to where we needed to be today had we had the opportunity to uh, launch. Uh, they overcame an awful lot. It, it's an outstanding team. Uh, the flow team uh, that got Endeavor ready to go fly, uh, it was super. Uh, I just uh, I can't say enough good things about them. So uh, these guys did a, an awesome job, and we'll get it right, and we'll go fly uh, as soon as we can. All right, before we wrap up, we have a one-minute video of President Obama's visit here this afternoon. And uh, after that, that will conclude our briefing. Thank you. Who's stuff is this? Oh, mine. Go ahead. 